Okay, um, good morning and welcome back. Um, the first speaker in this parallel session is Sergio Boicho, and he will ta tell us about characterizing quantum supremacy near-term devices. Thank you. Um, so first of all, quantum supremacy is an edgy name, but it might be a little bit too edgy, so sometimes I like to call it uh, beyond classical computing. I don't know if it's going to catch on. Maybe somebody can come up with a better name. Uh, but let me start with motivating why we're thinking about this. So this photograph right here is the current state of the art at the Google Hardware uh, Group, led by John Martinez. Uh, so this group is working in superconducting qubits, high fidelity, superconducting qubits, Xmon qubits. Um, what you see here is these are the qubits, Xmons. Uh, there you have, I think, six of them. These are the readout resonators. Um, uh, this is a 1D layout of qubits. And one thing that is very nice and is currently a work in progress, but uh, they are making very good progress, is there is this other chip that is going to come on top of this. And this chip is going to have the control lines, microwave lines, uh, C pulses to control these qubits. So you're going to be able to separate the control from the qubits themselves. The qubits can remain very coherent. And one important reason to do it this way and have one chip of, on top of the other with band bonds, superconducting band bonds that connect the control lines here with your qubits there is that this will allow us to do a 2D layout of superconducting qubits. So I'm going to be talking about uh, circuits. Uh, I'm thinking in superconducting qubits. It could be something else, which live in a 2D grid with nearest neighbors coupling. Um, we think that maybe uh, this year or next year, we'll see, uh, we're going to be able to have a layout of 7 by 7 high fidelity superconducting qubits. So that's the motivation for this work. And so the question is what to do with these devices. So um, what we have been thinking about, we and other people, is we would like to perform a well-defined computational task. This is very important. We want to write down in a piece of paper what particular computation we're trying to do, very explicitly. Uh, and the important thing, which is what this talk is about, is uh, this computational task with 7 by 7 qubits, we think, can be already beyond the capabilities of a state-of-the-art supercomputers. And that's what we call beyond classical computing, or also quantum supremacy, as introduced by John Preskill in this paper. Now, what is important to have in mind is we're kind of practical. We're thinking we want to do this when we have the chip available, maybe this year, next year. Uh, so this is going to be done in the near term. We're not going to have a correction, and therefore, we're going to be limited to solid circuits with high fidelity gates. So there is a lot of work, as you know, for a long time with superconducting qubits, improving the fidelities. Now you get fidelities of at least two nines for two qubit gates and around three nines for single qubit gates. Uh, so that's what we're going to get. So that's what we're thinking about. Now there is a catch here. Uh, we are not necessarily solving a practical problem. And as a matter of fact, in the stuff I'm going to be talking about, it's going to be a well-defined computational task, but it doesn't solve a practical problem that people necessarily care about. And I would say that's uh, a very big open question that I would like help people to think about. I know you're aware of this. What can you do with uh, once you have these chips? What can you do uh, with solid circuits, without error correction? And the important thing that makes this problem interesting is that uh, at least we believe we're going to be able to so fairly convincingly that we're going to have a computational resource for some problems already beyond the capabilities of supercomputers. OK. So if we want to do, um, if we want to do this uh, beyond classical computing or quantum supremacy in the near term, um, uh, what, what kind of problems that we think about? Well, quantum computers and these superconducting qubits, in particular, they are very good at doing quantum evolutions. So to make the problem harder for the classical supercomputers, we want to formalize a computational task, which we think requires the direct simulation of the quantum evolution to be solved by a classical computer. The only way the classical computer can solve the same task is some form of direct simulation. 
uh, why we want to have that? Well, it's because the direct simulation of quantum dynamics uh, for enough depth is going to be, the cost is going to be exponential in the number of qubits. So if we have a 7 by 7 grid, that's exponential in 2 to the 49, which is a very large number. Uh, so some physicists like to think of this as a typical characteristic of chaotic systems in the sense that if you have a chaotic evolution, which is very uh, sensitive to the specific parameters, which are going to be well specified because this is a formal computational problem, then the only way to really get the exact final state of this chaotic evolution is to simulate the evolution directly because if it's very chaotic, there are no symmetries or shortcuts that you can exploit to avoid doing the direct simulation. We also want to have a specific figure of merit for this computational task that tells us not only what computation we're doing, but how well we're doing that computation. It's actually going to be an approximate um, problem. So we want to have a figure of merit that tells us how, uh, how well we're doing this approximate computational task. And it is a plus, which is important for us because we're thinking very hard about the hardware, that this, this figure of merit is related to fidelity. So I'll explain how that goes in our particular case. And something that is also very interesting, and probably for folks in this, in this conference, is there are interesting relations to computational complexity. So previous work, we're going to be talking about sampling problems, so previous works and sampling problems that a lot of you are familiar with is boson sampling, and also uh, commuting circuits. We actually, when we talk about computational complexity, which will be at the end of my talk, there are, we use tools from, uh, that were developed for commuting circuits by Bremner and collaborators. Uh, there is a recent paper with a very interesting and strong conjecture by Aronson and Chan, which is related to what we're doing here, uh, which says that for a random circuit C, uh, with, there are some details uh, about how you actually choose this random circuit, but in a 2D lattice, actually. So that's good. Of depth around square root of n. There is no polynomial time classical algorithms that guesses the probability, if you start with zero, the probability to measure output all zeros. Uh, such that uh, and you want to guess if this probability is larger than the median overall output beta strings. Uh, and you want the polynomial time classical algorithm to guess this probability with success probability at least one half plus something, which is exponential in the number of qubits, crucially not the number of gates. This can be done. Uh, there's a polynomial time algorithm which will guess this with uh, probability scaling with 1 over 2 to the number of gates, but not 1 over 2 to the number of qubits that we know of. So this is a, a very strong conjecture, which is interesting. Um, nevertheless, uh, we still have a problem in terms of computational complexity, which is that computational complexity, as far as you know, is asymptotic. And I would say for the kind of problems we have here, well-defined computational tasks, where I write exactly what computation I'm trying to do, as far as I know, it requires a correction. So for instance, uh, we are not going to satisfy this conjecture in the near term because the quantum computer is also not going to have a success probability of scaling with the number of qubits because the fidelities of the gates are finite. So that means the probability of success is going to decrease with the number of gates, not the number of qubits. So we're not formally satisfying at least this conjecture, for instance, um, with a error correction. But this is still very interesting and it gives you stronger confidence, I guess, that uh, the classical competition will scale exponentially in the number of qubits, and therefore you're going to give classical supercomputers a hard time. So what is the particular uh, computational task we've been looking at? Well, the most obvious thing to do, I will say, is just do a random universal quantum circuits, because these are um, quantum dynamics, and they are very chaotic in the sense that if you do a random circuit and you get one gate wrong, uh, we will talk more about this later, then you're probably not going to get the correct output distribution here. So we're just going to have a random circuit in 2D. This is just an example in 1D. Uh, we are careful because we want to do this in the near term about what choice of gates we do and how we lay out the gates. Uh, maybe it will become a bit more clear what are our constraints. But let's just say uh, the main constraint is in these superconducting qubits at least. We have only control phase gates. So here are control C gates. We cannot do a control C gate in these two qubits and this nearest neighbor's qubits at the same time. There have to be one gap in the middle for technical reasons, at least at the moment. So that means we have to do some things at the beginning, like we do Hadamard's because the, the state tends to, let's say, scramble faster this way. And I'll be more specific about what measure are we using to gauge that. OK, so the, the 
particular computational problem that we want to solve is a sampling problem. And what we want to do is, given an instance of a random circuit where it's, I'm selecting with some rules that I'm giving you, a, a universal gate set, and I'm telling you what are your random probabilities to choose what gates. In this case, it's basically Hadamard T gates, square root of X and square root of Y, and then some layout of control C gates. So all the qubits have a chance to interact and correlations propagate. So the computational problem is to approximately sample from the output distribution uh, specified by this circuit or unitary if I'm measuring the computational basis. So that's, this is a well-defined computational problem. And we think that, the, that to solve this problem, you, the only way to do it is to do direct simulations of some sort. There are different ways to do that, but direct simulations nevertheless. And the cost will be, uh, in, in 2D, will be exponential in either the minimum of the number of qubits of the depth times the square root of n if you use tensor network contractions. Uh, so for seven by seven qubits, we think that the boundary, if you are careful enough and you look into the details of how this thing is going, is depth d around 40. So after d, depth d around 40, uh, we don't think that tensor network contraction will work either. And two to the 49 is just too many qubits to do the Schrodinger simulation. So that's our current best estimate. Now, this is also a good benchmark for quantum computers in the sense that we're doing a random circuit, which is going to create a very entangled state. And if we can estimate the fidelity with which we're doing this task, that's giving us a good benchmark for how well we're doing not just single qubit or two qubit gates, but how well we're doing very complex circuits, preparing very complex states. And as I said before, uh, this computational task is related to results in computational complexity, and I will talk about that a bit more later. So this is known about random circuits because they are chaotic evolutions, but uh, uh, you, you basically are gonna prepare some quantum state psi given by some amplitude C on the computational basis. We care about the probabilities of beta strings, which are of course the square of the amplitude. And what you can think is that you're gonna be not uniformly distributed in Hilbert space, but more or less you know, quasi uniformly distributed in Hilbert space. So that means that up to finite moments, not all moments, but up to finite moments, the um, distribution of these amplitudes should be Gaussian with mean zero and variance one over n. And if the amplitudes are Gaussian, that implies that the distribution of the probabilities, if I normalize it like this, with this large n is one over two to the n, so the size of Hilbert space, that should be the Porter, distribu the Porter Thomas distribution, has been around since the 50s, related to chaos actually, uh, which has this particular form. So we think that the other probabilities will be Porter Thomas distributed and not uniform between beta strings one over n. Okay, so there's a problem with that because this is a very flat distribution, right? Uh, so unfortunately, we don't know of any polynomial witness. So it's hard to verify the circuit because we don't know how to check in a black box setting, let's say, with a polynomial amount of classical resources that were doing the correct computation. So that's a problem. And, but I think this is probably required because we're doing this sampling problem, which is much harder than NP problems. Um, in the sense that, yeah, this will collapse the polynomial hierarchy and things like that. Um, but, you know, the, the PT distribution, the Porter Thomas distribution is very flat, so the probabilities decay, decay exponentially with minus NP, so they're going to be on the order of one over n. So, in a black box setting, that's a problem because just to distinguish this Porter Thomas distribution with uniform flat distribution over beta strings, it requires of the order of a square root of n measurements, which might be doable, it's not crazy, 2 to the 20 measurements. But still, all you're doing is just distinguishing Porter Thomas or some approximate Porter Thomas from uniform. Uh, so one saving grace we're gonna use to try to gauge that we're on the right track at least is we're gonna use that the, even though this distribution is very flat, if you look at the L1 distance between the Porter Thomas distribution and let's say the uniform distribution over beta strings, it's actually pretty large. Uh, with this normalization it's between zero and two, so it's two, two, two over E, so it's a finite uh, L1 norm, independent of the number of qubits. So that means that information theoretically, and in particular, if we calculate these probabilities, Pxj, which we can do probably not for 49 qubits and depth 40, but for, let's say, 42 qubits and whatever depth, then we can actually distinguish between the Porter-Thomas distribution and the uniform distribution. And I'll be more specific, we're gonna do something more sophisticated than this, but uh, this is a form of hardware verification in the sense that if you have too much noise, you expect to convert to the uniform distribution over beta strings. Okay, so, so we think we should be getting the Porter-Thomas distribution with enough depth 
So for this particular layout of circuit, which is very specific given the concrete hardware constraints of the qubits we care about, because those are the ones we have in our particular lab, other people might have different specifics about the layout of, this, of, of their circuits. We care about how fast we convert to the Porter-Thomas distribution, and we actually, one thing we care about is how fast we convert to the correct entropy from the Porter-Thomas distribution, which is different from the entropy of the uniform distribution. So that's this plot here we see as a function of depth with circuits by seven, seven times six qubits, so 42 qubits. This is a very expensive simulation done by uh, Mrs. Miliansky from Intel. Um, we care like what depth do you require to approximate the correct entropy, and we see only at depth. Uh, 15 or around 20, you're already very close. Actually, you're exponentially close at depth 30 to the correct Porter-Thomas distribution. This is for seven, sorry, six by six. Uh, another way to check that you're, that you're getting close to the Porter-Thomas distribution is to check not the entropy, but the moments. So we check the moments. This is related to the designs. In condensed matter, they call them participation ratios or inverse participation ratios. Um, we see that, well, the second moment does converge very quickly to Porter-Thomas, but actually higher moments. I'm normalizing these moments, so for the Porter-Thomas distribution, they're all one. So up to moment 10, for instance, a finite amount of moments, they converge quickly to the Porter-Thomas distribution, sort of at the same depth, and they all seem to converge, well, all, I mean, let's say moments of order maybe n, we don't exactly know what we think around order n, they converge to Porter Thomas, not an exponential amount of moments, of course, but the first moments at least they converge to the Porter Thomas distribution very quickly. There is a lot of interesting theory work related to the depth required to sort of prepare these very complex states, which is what we're getting with this Porter Thomas distribution. Uh, for instance, with decoupling in random circuits or anti concentration of sparse IQP circuits, it's known that the depth requires squares like a square root of n for a square root of n by a square root of n qubits, so n qubits in a 2D lattice and up to logarithmic corrections, and we expect this to hold also for the designs, uh, for entropy, uh, out of time order correlations, things like that. Okay, so we think we have a Porter-Thomas distribution, uh, and what is the computational task uh, that we do? Well, we, we want to sample from the Porter-Thomas distribution, so let's take a sample of around m bit strings. Experimentally, with superconducting qubits, m can be close to a million, let's say, in, that will take order of seconds. So we have around a million samples of random bit strings, and we want to check what's the likelihood that this sample came from the particular unitary that I'm trying to implement, right? Because my computational task is to sample from the probability distribution specified by this unitary, so let's check the likelihood, and actually the log likelihood, of a particular sample that I obtain, right? So if everything is, if it was ideal, if there was no noise, then the log likelihood uh, is proportional to the entropy of the Porter-Thomas distribution, and the entropy of the Porter-Thomas distribution, uh, you can just calculate that, and is uh, not the entropy of the uniform distribution, but there is this minus one plus gamma correction, which is independent of the number of qubits, where gamma is the Euler constant. So that tells you uh, what kind of likelihood you will get for samples in the ideal case. Now, if you have a classical polynomial time algorithm, uh, which will be like your classical competition that you, you, you want to run. Well, you can also take some sample of the same size, and now you're going to be looking at the likelihood that that sample from a classical algorithm, the likelihood that that sample could have been produced by the circuit that you specify. So how well it matches your computational task. And the log likelihood is now not given by the entropy, but it's given, it's given by the cross entropy, which is this expression. So it's not PU of X, it's PCL of X. But this is PU because I'm checking the likelihood that it came from the ideal circuit. So the log likelihood in this case is proportional to the cross entropy. So let's look at this cross entropy. And actually, let's look at the cross entropy when I average over circuits. So the computational task, of course, is not just for one instance to, to be able to do some approximately sampling from one particular instance, but if I do this 100 times, let's say, with different random instances of random circuits, and I take samples of a million samples in each case, then I, I want to look at the expectation value of this cross entropy average over circuits, over unitaries. So I want to look at this expression. So now I'm going to make an ansatz. Uh, so this is just an ansatz at this stage. It's kind of also related to Scott's conjecture, but it is an ansatz. Uh, that if this is a polynomial algorithm, given that you know this is a very hard computational task that requires to do direct simulation of the dynamics, uh, and you don't expect to have a polynomial algorithm to do this task. So then the 
sampling from the polynomial, classical algorithm, should be uncorrelated, more or less, with the correct distribution specified by the circuit, because the correct distribution requires exponential time. So if we calculate the cross-entropy, assuming that this classical distribution is uncorrelated with the distribution, and we average over circuits, then we get an expression which is log n plus gamma, which is different to the entropy for the correct Porter-Thomas distribution, which was log n plus gamma minus one. So there is a difference in the entropy and the cross-entropy. So here are some numerics sort of to support this conjecture. Uh, so what we do here is for circuits of depth uh, 25 and five times four qubits, actually, sorry, depth 40, uh, let's say we, we simulate the correct circuit, which you know, it's only 20 uh, qubits we can do. And we also drop, let's say in this case, uh, bit flip error, X error in every possible place. Okay, discrete X error. And we see the output distribution in that case. And now we calculate the correlation between the correct distribution and the distribution with one single error. And we see that they are almost uncorrelated. So this is depth where, where I drop my error, the color is like over the 20 different locations at that depth, and this axis here is correlation, and you see if I drop an error in the middle, I'm almost uncorrelated, supporting that conjecture. Uh, if you drop an error at the beginning, well, we started with Hadamard, so it gets absorbed in the initialization. And something similar happens with C errors, is that we're going to be measuring the computational basis. So error then gets absorbed in the measurement. So during most of the evolution, one discrete error breaks the correlation, which kind of supports this conjecture. So let's move on. We saw there was a difference between the cross-entropy if the distributions were uncorrelated, so the ideal distribution and the distribution that I used to take the sample, we're gonna call that H sub naught, and that was log n plus gamma. And so for any uh, algorithm, quantum experimental circuit, let's say, or a classical algorithm, we're gonna look at the cross-entropy now between that, the distribution produced by that, that algorithm and the ideal distribution, and we're gonna compare it with the worst case, which was an uncorrelated output, which of course you can always have. Uh, and if we look at this cross entropy difference, so what's the difference between the worst case and what we're actually doing, we call it alpha. Uh, well, let's see what happens in this cross entropy in the particular case that the algorithm is a noisy random circuit, which is what we're gonna get experimentally. So we can, We're gonna write that for distribution like this, which we can always do, but approximately we think this is correct. So we're gonna say it's gonna be some alpha tilde times the ideal circuit plus one minus alpha tilde, some density matrix that accumulates all the noise. This alpha tilde is the fidelity. And again, similar as before, we're gonna assume that uh, because we saw that any single discrete error completely gives you an uncorrelated distribution almost everywhere, it's the beginning at the end. We're gonna assume that uh, if you sample from this uh, part of the operator which accumulates the error, you're gonna be almost uncorrelated with the correct distribution. So if we use these ansatz, this is again another ansatz, or, then uh, we can work out this cross-entropy difference, alpha, as the difference between the worst case cross-entropy and the cross-entropy when my distribution has this density matrix. And in a couple of steps you get that the difference between the cost entropies is approximately the fidelity alpha tilde. So this is good because my figure of merit for this computational task, which is alpha, should give me, if I can calculate it, and I will talk about how you can calculate it later for small enough circuits, should give me an estimation of the fidelity, which we care about because we want to check the hardware. Okay, so let's check these ansatz we have been doing with some numerics uh, to see if things make sense. Uh, so we did numerics where um, we calculate the cross entropy, we drop in the standard way, depolarization channels with error rates R that are related to realistic figures of merit for fidelities in superconducting qubits. So the error rate is up to a small correction is the fidelity. So these numbers here are the error rates for two qubit gates, the control phases that we have in the experiment. Experimentally, we're more or less around here. Uh, we want to be between here and here, I guess. And um, we assume the single qubit gates to have a fidelity 10 times best, and initialization and measurement to have error rates of the order of the two qubit gates. So this is 
reasonable. We're using a very simple model, though, but it, it's been much, it matches well experiments that have been done before. Uh, so assuming that this our model works, well, we just do numerics. So we, we, we simulate the circuit with these depolarizing channels. We calculate the cross entropy. So those are the squares for different neural rates. And we calculate a very crude estimate, which will be in the next slide, just the product of the fidelities. So we estimate the fidelity as the product of the fidelity of the different gates. And we see that more or less this cross entropy corresponds to the estimate of the fidelity. It's a bit higher, probably because errors at the beginning and at the end get absorbed in, in initialization or measurement, but they do, affect, they do affect the fidelity. OK, so what is the actual experimental proposal then? Well, we want to implement a random universal circuit, and we have some specific rules of what circuits we care about. And we're going to take a large sample experimentally of around a million measurements, let's say between 1,000 and a million. And then, and this is the tricky part, at least if the circuit is not large enough, uh, sorry, is not very large, so let's say 42 qubits, or it doesn't have a lot of depth, or as Sergey Bravi will explain next, it doesn't have a lot of T gates, independent of the depth and the size, then we should be able to calculate with a classical computer these probabilities. So the, this bit of string came from the experiment, and with a classical computer, not with the quantum computer, yes, we'll calculate the log of the probability that that particular bit of string came from the correct distribution, the ideal distribution. If I average these quantities uh, over my measurements and I normalize it properly with this log over n plus gamma, this gives me uh, an estimate of the cross entropy alpha up to corrections which go like one over the square root of the number of measurements. So for a million measurements, this is not our biggest concern. Uh, and as we explained before, we think that this cross entropy should give us an estimate of the actual uh, fidelity of the preparation. So the plan is to measure this when we can. So for size, let's say up to 42, for depth up to, let's say, 20, 25 with 49 qubits, uh, you know, with the depth 40 and 49 qubits, but only like 50 T gates, more or less. And so then, then we can actually measure this. And then we're going to extrapolate all these plots in sort of different axes. This cross entropy so much the fidelity estimate. So here is the fidelity estimate from just multiplying the fidelities. And if all this works, then we have confidence that the hardware is working. So it's really just very fine that the hardware is working when we can test it. So it should also be working if now I put a few more T gates or I make it a bit bigger or something like that. And at some point, we cannot verify it anymore, unfortunately but it should be doing some approximate sampling with some fidelity that, as far as we know, a classical supercomputer cannot match, and that's what we call beyond classical computing. Okay, so I said there, was, there were interesting relations between this and complexity theory. So here is one approach. Um, so if you have, so we're interested on the square of this amplitude. So let's just think about this amplitude. I start in a state zero, I do my unit your circuit, and I want to estimate, calculate the amplitude for output beta string x. So this is a well-known trick. If you, you have levels, clock cycles in this 2D circuit, so at every one of these levels, you can introduce an identity, uh, which we're going to call s, because we're going to think of them as spins in a basis plus minus one. That's fine. It's just what you call your basis. And then we basically have to multiply all the levels over all possible beta strings, which are the complexions of the identity in the middle. So this looks like if you want some sort of discrete path integral, right? Where I'm zooming over all the paths, and the paths are specified by these beta strings that you're putting in the middle, like the trotterization in Path Integral Monte Carlo that was discussed in some other talks. OK, so this is the expression that we care about. Well, it turns out that if I look at one of these pieces for our particular gates, uh, like a square root of x, for instance, then you can actually write it, because I'm using these spin bases, as something that looks like an icing model. OK? So I have this interaction between spins, and k is the clock cycle. So if I put a square root of x, it can flip the spin. So this is an interaction between a spin and one clock cycle and another spin that I may get in the next clock cycle. This number here, alpha jk, is one if I have a, a square root of x in that particular cycle, zero 
in other cases. So you only get this interaction if I actually had the square root of x. And there is a phase in front of it. And the same holds for T gates, which are actually simpler because it's just a phase in these bases, or square root of y, or control C gates. So the conclusion is that you can write this expression okay, as an exponential of expressions that look like this. So an exponential of something that looks like an IC model with some complex phase in front of it. And if you do that, you are writing this expression, you're summing over all bit strings, so you're writing this expression as something proportional to the partition function of an IC model at complex temperature. So these random circuits have probabilities that are proportional to the partition function square now of IC models at some complex temperature, in this case pi over 8. Now, there is a very, if you want to calculate this partition function sort of approximately, there is a very strong sign problem because you have only a finite number of phases because all these numbers are sort of discrete. And, but the paths corresponding to the number of phases are exponentially large in the number of gates compared to the value of the partition function, so it's a very strong sign problem. Uh, what is more, um, this is known to be, in the worst case, it's known to be probabilistically, so the complexity of probabilistic approximating this partition function, even if you have an MP oracle, is still sharp higher, even with an MP oracle. So here are some reference about that. Uh, so Mick Bremer and collaborators made recently a conjecture that this holds not only in the worst case, but sort of in the average case for some fraction of partition functions if you select this partition function randomly. And in our paper, we say what's the distribution of couplings and things like that. Uh, so if you will have this conjecture, then what they prove in this paper, and we just adapted, is that now with an icing problem, which is slightly different to the one in their paper, uh, then you shouldn't be able to sample, because if you were able to sample, then you could use an MP oracle to approximate these partition functions, which you're assuming is MP hard to do. So in another way, uh, we just use the same technique and in this paper to argue that approximately sampling, an algorithm that will approximately sample from this distribution will collapse the polynomial hierarchy. That's sort of the technical term. Based on this particular conjecture with a slightly different IC models. There are 3D models in our case. Um, now, this, you know, there is this new conjecture by Scott, which is very strong and very interesting. This alternative way also gives another interesting perspective, which is it connects to IC models. So for instance, in this paper, actually, they saw that for some particular complex temperature or phases, you can actually solve these IC models. And it turns out that corresponds to Clifford Gates. So just to say, it's interesting to think about these problems from this different perspective in terms of IC models, not just circuits, and you can prove certain things. Okay, so um, I'm almost done. This is uh, just to give you an idea of how hard it is to do this simulation in practice. These are numbers from Mises Milianski from Intel, uh, who run these very large seven by six simulations on the Edison supercomputer. And you see, well, that uh, the memory scales exponentially, uh, time scales badly, and even for six, seven by six circuits, you needed 70 terabytes of memory, and around half of the nodes in the Edison supercomputer and it took like around a thousand seconds. So this, even at seven by six, with what I think is very optimal code, some people might think they can do better, and that might be true, but this code is very decent. Um, you know, it's an expert from Intel, right? Um, so it is very expensive to do these simulations even by seven, seven by six. So, you know, as you grow, somebody has to let you use a full supercomputer for quite a long time, as far as we know. Okay, so. So I'm open questions. The main one, which I mentioned at the beginning, this is a, not a practical computation, it's just sampling from a random circuit. So the main open question, I think, is what can we do which is not just a random computation? So it's something of practical value. So people are thinking about quantum chemistry or approximate optimization, for instance. So I encourage you to give different um, other alternatives, but details matter, so you really have to be careful about how many gates you have, things like that. And you know, there are things, well, you might want to have a experimental proof of error correction that's not related to this, but something you will do with a small circuit, of course. Just proof that you're getting all the correct constants for the surface code, for instance. Uh, eventually, you know, as you scale the number of qubits, you're gonna have control problems, and D-Wave has managed to solve that in a different you know, architecture, but that's a problem. You know, as you scale to 1,000 qubits, you don't want to have 2,000 wires. You want to improve the fidelity, of course, as much as possible. Uh, 
this result, I said, doesn't work with realistic errors, so it would be very good to have complexity theory results for these random circuits with full error, uh, without full error correction, improve some bounds into these, such as anti-concentration or TD signs, and uh, you know we're still working on optimal classical simulations algorithms to know exactly where the competition lies. So I'll just leave my conclusions there, and I'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Sergio. Um, so I have a very kind of general question. Uh, in, in your view, is this quantum supremacy business more a theory or an experimental challenge? And like in particular, do you think that states that achieve quantum supremacy in a very controlled way have been achieved, say an optical lattice when you quench the system? Um, so is it in my view, it's mainly an experimental challenge. I didn't understand your question. Yeah, my question is whether the main challenge is experimental or theoretic. From um, my point of view, the main challenge is experimental. Okay, so you don't think that states that achieve quantum supremacy in a controlled way have already been produced in other experiments? Uh, and I, I, I want, okay, I don't, think, I don't think they have been produced for the case where you specify very clearly, what is the exact computational task that you're trying to solve, and what is the fear of merit? But like an optical lattice, we know exactly what the Hamiltonian is. You can quench it. There's some complicated dynamics. Can't predict that. Yeah, so you have to write in a piece of paper what are your complicated dynamics, what is your figure of merit, and measure those figure of merit. So that's a theory challenge, right? I think, as far as I, yeah, I think that's a, yeah, I think that's a huge challenge. But, you know, uh, optical lattices might be that in that sense. Uh, if they do that, if they write like, this is yeah. my quench dynamics, this is how I measure my fidelity, yeah. uh, they might achieve quantum supremacy or a version of quantum supremacy sooner. People might say that you know, the device simulating itself is not universal circuits, uh, so there will be some debate there, but I think it will be a very interesting experiment nevertheless, yes. But I do care a lot about you know, writing a piece of paper, what is the computation? Otherwise, you know, D-Wave is doing computations that we're not sure how to reproduce, right? Might be noise, might be this, might be that. I mean, have they achieved quantum supremacy? Well, in my view, I mean, I'm, I like D-Wave and the things they are doing, but uh, I think you really need to be very formal about what specific problem you're solving and how you measure it. Thanks. Okay, um, more questions? There's a question here. Um, it seems to me, and I may be misinterpreting this, that when using a random quantum circuit, you're actually comparing average case quantum complexity to worst case classical complexity. Um, you mentioned some boundaries that you're working in where you have a, you're restricting yourself to a number of T gates um, per circuit, but um, is there any kind of like boundary conditions you guys are looking at? What's the worst possible circuit for the quantum case uh, and comparing that to the classical instead of a random circuit? I'm not sure I, I mean, I have some problems here in your question, but I think you said, uh, are you asking like if we have been studying as you increase the error rate, for instance, like at what point you can simulate the circuit? Well, with the, with the random circuit yeah. on, on the quantum chip, uh, it seems like that's the average case instead yeah. of the worst case possibility for a circuit. Is there some boundary conditions that you guys are testing to put the worst possible circuit on the quantum chip and comparing that to the classical counterpart? So the worst possible circuit in the quantum case? The most difficult case on the quantum chip. Uh -huh. um, the, the most number of gates, a completely saturated circuit, or I'm not really sure what that can, constitutes on your chip. Um, well, we think these random circuits are sort of the worst case, but I'm not sure if I understood your question because I don't hear you very well. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, maybe that, maybe okay. that can be taken offline. Time for one more question. And could the next speaker please set up the computer in the meantime? So maybe I'll just continue the same line. Um, <laughs> maybe I can uh, hear you better. Sorry, uh, there's a lot of echo. I don't. Okay, so... Um, I consider the setup, so you have two D lattice, right? So you can randomly set up uh, like uh, C CZ gates, basically, right? And you have some noise. And so the question is, um, 
what is known for average case uh, hardness of this problem. Because I, I know results, you know, like if there is noise, there is something known on average case. Sorry, I don't hear you very well. Can you just say <laughs> one sentence that maybe I can understand? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I want to know. You can use the mic. Okay, I want to know what's known about com hardness of average case under three circumstances. You have noise, you have 2D geometry. Um, oh, I guess it's two circumstances. So, noise plus 2D geometry. What's, and you do average kind of random circuit. It's With so noise. Like, yes. So, what's known about uh, hardness of this from the. Well, I think. With IQP circuits, there is an interesting paper with some amount of noise. I think Fuji is going to talk about uh, also circuits with noise. Uh, I think in random circuits in particular for, you know, like this is the, the sort of ideal circuit that I want you to solve, and then you're going to approximately sample. Once you put noise, um, my intuition is that uh, as long as you can measure this cross entropy, uh, for a large, well, okay, yeah, but you cannot measure it. Yeah, I, I don't know what's the average case complexity. I think it scales with the number of gates. We know that, right? Because you can do this Feynman path, you know, integral approach, and then you can get an approximation. Uh, but I don't think these lines cross. I think um, the fidelities are high enough that in the foreseeable future, no approximation algorithm that we can think of actually can sample at, with the same, you know, cross entropy as the noisy quantum circuit. Once you go beyond what you can do with exact circuits, I think our approximate circuits scale much worse than uh, high fidelity to these circuits. But I don't know, I, I don't know, there is no theorem to prove that as far as I can tell. Okay, thank you. Let's thank Sergio again.